We have an epic 7.2.4 Dolby Atmos home theater tour for you all today. Uh, we're going to tour the theater of a friend of mine. His name is Jonathan. I met him probably about two years ago on the Canadian Audio and Home Theater Group on Facebook, and we've been buddies ever since. Uh, he's a solid guy, and he's built himself a truly amazing home theater in his basement using JTR, Funk, and JVC. So stick around to see John's work. I'm Barrett. This is Spec of Tech. Welcome to the channel. This tour has actually been a long time in the making. Uh, John lives in Ontario and I live in Alberta, so we're 300 and or, sorry 3,330 kilometers apart or 2,069 miles, so that makes things difficult. Plus, John wanted to get uh, all of the upgrades that he had planned done before the tour, but we are finally here and I feel his theater is definitely worth the wait. While we are touring his theater, I will be reading the responses to certain questions in John's own words. It'll just be my voice and it'll be why he made certain decisions and why he chose certain units and certain equipment. So make sure to show your support down in the comments below for John's system. But let's get into this tour. Uh, we are saving the back of the room for last because John has an absolutely monstrous 24 inch subwoofer there and we need to talk about it. Ever since I was little, I loved going to sporting events with my father. While I am a huge sports fan, I always enjoyed the spectacle that goes along with it. I love feeling the bass and listening to the music in between whistles. Whenever going into big box stores like Best Buy, I was always drawn to the home theater section, especially when they were playing bass heavy music or movies. That thump sound, chest slam, is just super attractive to me. When I was 14, my dad purchased a high-end 50-inch Sony Grand Wega rear projection TV, which was the bee's knees at the time, uh, 20 some years ago. We also had a decent surround sound setup, probably cost him around $20,000. Nobody I knew had a setup quite like this at the time. I enjoyed tinkering with the picture settings and dabbling in audio. Ever since, no matter where I lived, I always had some sort of big screen and surround sound. So John's room is L-shaped and by no means a dedicated space. The room is multi-purpose, including a workout area, pool table, and air hockey table. The theater area is 16 feet wide by 26 feet uh, from screen to back wall and with seven and a half foot ceilings. For his left and right towers, he is using the intimidating JTR 212 RTs, which utilize dual high performance 12 inch neodymium woofers and a neodymium coaxial compression driver mated with a 60 by 60 wooden horn. These two monster towers are complemented by the equally capable JTR 212 HTR center channel, which when laid on its side is an MTM configuration with the exact same drivers as the 212 RT tower speakers. For home theater, they are raved about by our peers. I was blown away by their clarity, dynamics, and they truly dig deep when ran in full range. You hear so much detail, I couldn't believe what I was missing when comparing them to the SVS Ultra Towers they replaced. While these speakers aren't inexpensive when comparing them to the SVS, Klipsch's, etc. of the world, they easily match and in some cases outperform speakers that cost two or three times more than they do. I also chose JTR due to their sheer size. Prior to purchasing them, I had the Funk 24 inch subwoofer on my front stage, which just dwarfed the SVS towers, which is kind of funny because I wouldn't call the SVS tower small by any means. Having the JTRs match the height of the Funk definitely helped in the aesthetics department. For side surround duty, John is using the SVS Ultra Surround, which is a diverse little speaker that can be used in dipole, bipole, or in duet mode. And similarly, for the rear surrounds, John is running the SVS Ultra Bookshelf speakers. Both the side surrounds and the rear surrounds are in the gorgeous gloss black that SVS is known for. John says that the SVS do work quite well with his current front stage, but when I asked, and he responded, I fully intend on getting a complete JTR base layer set up and maybe eventually the four height speakers in 2022. I would have sooner, but I had other priorities like the JVC NX5 and the Stuart screen. I am also holding out hope that the Canadian dollar improves. Buying an USD really does kill me. Moving up to the height speakers, John is using four of the Polk RCI 80s in ceiling speakers, which consists of a tweeter and a beefy eight inch driver. So those are the 11 speakers that make up John's ear level and height speakers. So let's talk about what John uses to process the sound and power all of his speakers.
At the helm of John's home theater is the Marantz AV7705, which is an 11.2 channel Dolby Atmos and DTS X enabled processor. In traditional Marantz fashion, it is filled with all of the bells and whistles that were available at the time it was manufactured. I've always liked Marantz and have had lots of experience with Odyssey over the years. Prior to the 7705, I was running the 6012 AVR with the internal amplification. It was okay, but I knew I was lacking a bit of oomph, so I purchased two Emotiva XBA amplifiers, which seemed to bring my front stage to life. Unfortunately, I was having an issue with one of the RCA preouts on the 6012, so I ended up selling it to a friend who had no intentions of using the preouts, and then I purchased the 7705. The biggest difference was channel separation, but also now I had access to the Odyssey Multi EQ editor app, which has a ton of customizable options. To this day, I am still satisfied. While it's crossed my mind plenty of times, I've been able to stave off the what if bug. At this point, my intentions are to keep the 7705 until the next generation of processors are released in a few years. While the Anthems, Arkhams, and JBLs of the world are enticing, I believe I've reached a point of diminishing returns. With that being said, John is actually currently quite curious about trying the Anthem AVM70 processor. So moving on to the power, John is powering all 11 channels with a combination of the Emotiva XPA5 Gen 1 and the Emotiva XPA6 Gen 2, which offer plenty of power to each speaker. Both of these amps are capable and provide more than enough juice for the efficient JTR speakers. I can easily crank it without any distortion and I will give up before the Emos and the JTRs do. I do find them to be a bit on the bright side and their noise floor isn't great. They produce a slight hiss sound, which thankfully can only be heard when standing next to the speakers. I have plans on replacing the amps in due time. For his media, John uses the Nvidia Shield Pro and for gaming, he uses the Xbox One and PS4 and for gaming on a big screen like that, it must be incredible. And speaking of that big screen, John recently upgraded to the 120 inch 16 by nine Stewart Studio Tech 130 G4 screen with a 1.3 gain. Everyone tells me I should have gone with an AT or acoustically transparent screen, but personally, I do like to see my speakers, sun's out, gun's out. The only downside of this is having a horizontal center channel that doesn't quite line up with the towers. Uh, when there is a scene that's panning across the screen, at times it is noticeable. Prior to the Stewart, I was running an elite screen which had uniformity issues and spots that looked dirty and would sparkle in bright scenes. I then upgraded to the Grand View 120 inch 16x9. While the picture quality was much better, this one had terrible uniformity issues with visible vertical lines. Unfortunately, the replacement came with a huge rip in it uh, due to poor packaging, so I was done with budget screens, so to speak, and decided to bite the bullet and just purchase the Stewart. The Stewart has no sparkle or texturing that I could easily detect, and it was clear to me the minute I unboxed it, the screen was quality and probably the last screen I will buy unless I decide to get an acoustically transparent screen. Casting an image on John Stewart's screen, John recently made the change from a Sony VPL VW295ES to the famous JVC RS1000, which is essentially identical to the NX5. I actually ran an Optima UHD 50 for about a year and then got the upgrade bug. I was lucky to find an almost brand new Sony VPL for about $2,500 from a family that didn't have the space to use it. It still smelled new and it had the original box, power cable and warranty. This was a huge jump in quality over the Optima. I then sold the Sony for about $4,500 and purchased the JVC NX5. Honestly, I thought there would be a big difference in picture quality, but it wasn't as large as I thought. The biggest difference between the two is the NX5 has better black levels and adaptive HDR modes. Looking back on it, it may have been smarter to just keep the Sony and use the funds elsewhere. To keep things comfortable, John has three Valencia Tuscany power recliners with an L-shaped sofa along the one wall. 
Behind the Valencia Theatre seating, John put a two-seater bar where he can relax with a drink and watch his favorite movie or listen to some music. All right, now it's time to talk subwoofers. I saved this for last because John is using a subwoofer that very few people in the world have. But before we get into subwoofers, please consider subscribing and helping me get to 20,000 subscribers. Tick the bell icon if you do, and please take just one second out of your day to hit that like button and show John's amazing theater a little bit of love. Before we get into John's absolutely amazing 24 inch subwoofer at the back of his room, let's talk about the two he has at the front of his room. Flanking the media stand holding that beastly center channel, John has dual funk audio 18E subwoofers, which use an 18 inch driver with a neodymium magnet structure and a 2200 watt RMS amplifier in a sealed enclosure. John did have some concerns about mixing these two sealed subwoofers with his ported LFE24 Ultra, but was assured by Nathan Funk that with some modifications to the 18E's DSPs uh, that would be done prior to shipping, that he would make it work. But those dual 18 inch subwoofers are only there to complement their big brother. For those of you that watch the channel, you may remember me doing a video about the Funk Audio LFE24 Ultra. And in that video, I talked about a guy named John V who purchased the exact same subwoofer that I did. Well, this is John V. The video for that uh, will be linked in the top right hand corner if you guys are interested. But sitting like a big bad bouncer at the back of John's room stands the Funk Audio LFE24 Ultra. Now, as I just said, this subwoofer is something that I have owned and experienced for myself. It is a true unrivaled beast when it comes to output. Well guys, I have to say, what a beautiful system. Uh, I've wanted to showcase John's amazing system for some time, and I'm glad this finally happened. But that sums up the equipment aspect of this video, and I must say that John has assembled some of the greatest equipment out there for home theater. But since this is about John's home theater, I wanted to include a little bit more of a personal aspect for him, so I wanted to include his answers to some of the more personal questions that I asked, or at least some that weren't about the equipment. Nothing imminent, I would eventually like to buy JTR 110 HTs for my sides and rears and replace my Emotiva amplifiers with Cherry Amps. I despise going to the theaters from the people, the lines and the expense of food. Not to mention with COVID, the theaters were closed for over a year. Being able to be in the comfort of my own home to kick back and relax and watch movies in as good, if not better sound than you'd find in the theaters is the biggest win. My wife is a huge Marvel nerd and loves to kick her feet up and enjoy the theater as much as I do. While she isn't a huge bass head and often asks that I turn it down, she has been super supportive of my hobby. My kids are often watching with us, but they'd be okay watching the same content on their iPads. Yuck. I've taken some time to convert my disc collection to MKV files, which are stored on my computer. These are one-to-one -one copies without any compression. I access the files over my gigabit network through the NVIDIA Shield using Plex or Kodi. 
I've also taken some time to isolate and extract specific scenes for demo purposes. This is key for when I have friends over. I'm no longer futzing around with discs or even fast forwarding through Plex Cody to find specific scenes. I just open my demos folder and immediately have access to the specific scenes. And some of my favorites are Godzilla vs Kong Hong Kong battle, the sea battle and the war bats, along with the Mecha Godzilla. And for John Wick 3, I like the glass fight as well as the Parabellum Hotel shootout. And of course, Ready Player One, the race scene, which is pretty famous. And also Alita Battle Angel, the Moro Ball race. And then there's Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, the final scene. Uh, boss battle is epic. And this is why we are in this incredible hobby, guys. I was glad to share John's work on his home theater. He has put together an incredible home theater. So I hope you guys really did enjoy that. Remember to subscribe, tick the bell icon if you do, and please take just one second to show John's theater some love and hit that like button. And make sure that you enjoy your systems. I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.